Thank you to Vite Ramen for supporting this SciShow compilation video. Vite Ramen makes craft ramen in a variety of chef-crafted flavors. To check it out for yourself and get 10% off, you can go to viteramen.com slash scishow and use the code scishow at checkout. It's a simple story, really. Insect meets plant. Insect can't take its eyes off plant. Insect pollinates plant, and plant protects insect. It's beautiful and symbiotic. But sometimes that relationship isn't so simple. Sometimes the plant is already mixed up with a fungus when the insect comes along. Sometimes the insect uses the plant for its own means and ends up draining the plant of everything it once had. It's great when living things can get along with each other, but even for insects and plants, things can get messy. So let's start with the good times, when a bee first lays its eyes on a flower. Here is where it all begins. If you ever watch a bumblebee really closely, you will notice that some of them do something kind of odd when they're leaving a flower. They'll turn around mid-flight and just stare at it, like they're a little drone taking footage, like they're like, that was a really beautiful flower, I want to get another look at it. They're not doing it to collect information for their hive mates. Although bumblebees do live in colonies, they are solitary foragers. And also, not every bee does this the same way. Researchers have found that the biggest bees do it the most. So what are they doing? It seems to have something to do with memory. This behavior is called learning flight and bees do it so they can remember how they got there. They're taking a mental image of what the flower and the surrounding area look like so that they can visit it again. Now that doesn't explain why the bigger bees would do this more. That's a question that came up in a 2021 study published in Current Biology. In it, researchers were studying bumblebee learning flights by offering bumblebees fake flowers with fake nectar. And even though the bees didn't seem to notice that the flowers and the nectar were totally fake, they did realize that some of them were more rewarding rewarding than others. The nectar in different flowers consisted of either 20 or 50 percent sugar, so some flowers were kind of meh and others were a pretty good score. What was unexpected was that the bigger bees worked harder to remember the more rewarding flowers. They spent more time facing the flowers while flying away from them on their learning flights. Meanwhile, the smaller bees didn't seem to care. In fact, they treated all flowers equally. This was surprising because if you're a bee and you find a really rewarding flower, it seems you would want to remember it regardless of how big you are, but that doesn't seem to be the case. And it turns out, a key variable is carrying capacity. Smaller bees don't forage that often. They spend more time on tasks around the nest. So when they do forage, they're limited by how far they can travel, so they tend not to be super picky. They don't bother putting all that effort into remembering super potent flowers because, well, they probably couldn't carry that much from them anyway. But larger bees can fly farther and carry more nectar back to the colony. Plus, their size means they can handle the cold better, and they have better eyesight so they can visit flowers in the morning when the light is low and there's more nectar around. So it may be worthwhile for them to seek out and memorize the locations of more rewarding flowers. Overall, it's not totally unexpected to see different bees in the same colony adopting different learning behaviors. But it was surprising to find that these behaviors seem to be based on size. Now the question is, how many other overlooked bumblebee behaviors are there? Because the more we understand them, well, the more we get to marvel at how cool and complex bumblebees are. But also, knowledge like that can help us figure out how to care better for our fuzzy friends. That is just the cutest thing ever. The bee takes a mental image of the flower so that it can return later. But what if the bee comes back and the flower has a different visitor? That flower is becoming quite involved with a fungus. Now there's a love triangle and things are getting more complicated, so here's Michael with the details on how the three of them work it out. There are tons of cooperative relationships in nature, and one of the most obvious is between bees and flowers. Bees visit flowers for their tasty pollen and nectar, and they help pollinate the plant as they go. We've known about this for years, and it's so basic that you probably learned about it in elementary school. But hold on to your juice boxes and kickballs, because this story is more interesting than we thought. In fact, there's a third, much tinier member of this relationship. Yeast. Yeast is a fungus found all over the globe, and the types that live in your garden do a bunch of important jobs. For instance, they help plant matter decompose, and they help roots absorb nutrients and water. Some of them also hang out in nectar, where they feed on its sugar. So there's obviously some plant yeast friendliness going on here. But as for how pollinators factor into that, that took a bit to sort out. Like, because yeast eats the nectar's sugar, pollinators might get less nutrition from yeasty nectar so maybe they'd avoid it. Then again, a 2018 study showed that yeast can change a nectar's scent by altering its chemistry, and we know scent affects pollinators too. 
So maybe that factors into this somehow? Really, there are a lot of variables. So in 2019, a group in Belgium set out to get a better understanding of this role yeast actually plays in the pollinator-plant relationship. In one experiment, they took buff-tailed bumblebees and introduced them to a field of fake flowers. Some contained a yeast and sugar solution, while others just had sugar water. They had hypothesized that the yeast would negatively impact the bees' behavior and health. Except, well, not only did the bees show no aversion to the yeasty flowers, the yeast helped their colonies grow. The hives that ate this nectar even had fewer larvae die, which led to more worker bees and an overall healthier colony. We'll need more research to say why, but the authors think this could be because yeast stores nutrients in its cell walls, so even if the nectar has fewer nutrients, the yeast might ultimately help the bees. Through other tests, the team even discovered that yeasts could suppress the growth of a bumblebee gut parasite called Crithidia bombi, which might play a role in the overall decline of honeybees. Again, the team isn't totally sure why, but they suspect the yeast could be out-competing the parasite for food in the bee's gut, which is pretty metal for a single-celled organism. So based on this, it looks like nectar full of yeast is helpful for bumblebees. And the bees help the yeast, too. As they move from flower to flower, they take the fungi with them and spread them around. And just to really come full circle here, that's even good news for the flowers. A study published in 2010 found that yeast gives off heat as it breaks down sugar. So yeast in nectar increased the flower's temperatures by up to 6 degrees Celsius. Then another study published in 2013 found that bumblebees are more likely to feed from warmer flowers probably because it makes the nectar less sticky and easier to drink. So, the yeast might be making flowers more appealing to bumblebees, too. And since bumblebees are pollinators, well, it's a happy love triangle for everyone. Sometimes, in that love triangle, the plant uses the insect, and that kind of one-sided relationship is not healthy for the insect. But when the insect falls for the plant's charming ways, this one-sided relationship can go too far. Beyond unhealthy, here's a plant that lured an insect to its death. Darwin's fascination with Drosera, a kind of plant known as a sundew, stemmed from its ability to capture and digest insects. He categorized it, and other plants like it, as insectivorous plants. We know them today as carnivorous plants because, well, they're not that picky. Several species of the plants have been known to trap and digest frogs and even small mammals. You've probably heard of the Venus flytrap, but did you know that it's just one of more than 600 known carnivorous plant species, with more discovered every year? Scientists generally look for two things when defining a carnivorous plant. It has to be able to absorb nutrients from a dead animal, and it must have some adaptation that it uses to attract, capture, kill, and digest its prey. But where do these adaptations come from? And why would a plant need to eat meat when it gets its energy from the sun for free? Well, while most plants get their nitrogen and nutrients from soil through their roots, carnivorous plants are typically found in swampy environments like bogs, where water is constantly washing those nutrients away. So they get their nitrogen from animal tissue, absorbed through glands in their specially modified leaves. How exactly they do this varies widely among hundreds of species in at least nine plant families. There are pitcher plants, for example, which lure their prey with sweet nectar into leaves that resemble a long tube. Insects fall from the slippery rim of the pitcher into what's known as a pitfall trap. This is filled with a mix of rainwater, digestive enzymes, and the leftovers of previous prey. Not exactly a fun way to die. Then there are bladderworts, which with over 200 species make up the largest group of carnivorous plants. They use bladder-shaped leaves lined with trigger hairs and topped with a sort of trap door. When an insect touches one of the hairs, the door opens and sucks in the victim. Within 15 minutes, the prey is digested. Quite efficient. Species of the sundews described by Darwin act much like a spider web, luring and catching insects with sticky drops disguised as nectar. But those drops contain a thick, mucus-like substance that traps the prey on the leaves' sticky tentacles. And the Venus flytrap is well known for a good reason. Its eponymous trap activates when an insect walks across the leaf and applies pressure to its trigger hairs. But it doesn't initially close all the way. Scientists believe that this is the plant's way of letting smaller bugs escape so it doesn't waste time digesting a low-nutrient meal. Instead, it closes a second time soon after, using enzymes enzymes similar to those in our stomachs to slowly digest its prey. Unlike other carnivorous plants, the Venus flytrap can take up to 10 days to finish its meal. For more than 150 years, carnivorous plants in their astounding diversity have fascinated and perplexed botanists. And until the late 1980s, many scientists thought they all shared a common ancestor. But studies in the last 25 years have shown that carnivory, as it's called, evolved independently at least six times within five orders of plants. Carnivorous plants are a pretty wonderful example of convergent evolution in which unrelated organisms develop similar traits in response to their environment. In this case, nutrient-poor swamps and bogs all around the world. 
Now, at this point, you might be sympathizing with the insects. But all relationships have at least two sides. The plant is just doing what it has to do to get nutrients. And the insect isn't always a helpless victim. It, too, can do serious damage to the plant. Just ask any plant that has had the misfortune of engaging with a spittle bug. Here is what they would tell you. Over half of all insects eat plants, but most of them don't do any real damage. The spittlebug, on the other hand, falls into the minority. It seems like an innocuous critter named for the frothy foam it leaves behind. Yet when farmers see this foam, it might throw them into a panic, because though the bugs themselves aren't that big a deal, they could be a sign of imminent crop doom. Cercopoidea is a superfamily of bugs containing more than 3,000 individual species that can be found all over the world. They're more commonly known as spittlebugs or frog hoppers. These little guys usually come in somewhere between the size of a short grain of rice and an unshelled peanut. But what makes spittlebugs unique and deadly is their diet. Spittlebugs feed exclusively on a substance called xylem sap, which is the liquid that moves dissolved nutrients and minerals from the soil through a plant's root system and into the plant. Xylem sap is a little different from phloem sap, which transports sugars produced by photosynthesis. Luckily for spittlebugs, lots of plants have xylem sap. Like like all vascular plants, ones that use a system of vessels to transport nutrients. That's most plants outside of mosses and a few others. So spittlebugs have options when deciding where to eat out. When spittlebugs are in their nymph stage prior to adulthood, they feed on xylem sap by piercing plants with tube-shaped mandibles designed for sucking up liquid. Now, unfortunately for them, xylem sap isn't very efficient food since it's low in nutrients. That means spittlebugs eat a ton. One spittlebug can consume 280 times their own body mass in xylem sap in a 24-hour period. That would be like you eating 19 tons of food every day. Of course, all that delicious sap has to go somewhere, and fast, so spittlebug nymphs excrete the excess Anally. The spittlebug adds some chemicals and then mixes in air. The result is a foamy substance known as cuckoo spit, which spittlebugs use to envelop themselves in a protective bubbly cocoon that actually looks like spit, but is more like pee. And it doesn't have anything to do with the birds. It just tends to show up in early spring, just like cuckoos do. It's not bird spit, it is bug pee, just so we're clear on this. It's cute, if also disgusting, and doesn't seem like it should be that much of a problem. But spittlebugs are a huge threat to plants. Not on their own, though their feeding can damage plants' overall health. The real reason spittlebugs are actually dangerous is because they can spread a deadly plant bacterium called Xylella fastidiosa. That sounds a lot like it is a Hogwarts spell, but it causes a very real and very deadly disease in plants. In fact, it's considered one of the most dangerous bacterial infections in plants and can infect more than 500 60 plant species worldwide. These bacteria infect a plant's xylem, which is exactly where the bug's mouth parts are biting. When a plant becomes infected with Xylella fastidiosa, the bacteria forms colonies that clog up the xylem's channels and block the flow of water and nutrients within the plant. As a result, the plant can't absorb the nutrients it needs, which is Definitely not a good thing. Once a plant is infected, its leaves begin to fall off, its growth slows, and if the infection continues unchecked, the plant will die. These tiny, cuckoo-spit-producing bugs transmit these deadly bacteria from plant to plant as they feed. When a spittlebug drinks from an infected plant, the bacteria colonize its gut. So when the spittlebug moves to the next plant and chows down, it passes along the bacteria, too. That's bad for plants, of course, but it is also bad for farmers and food production, which can be hard hit by this spittlebug-borne disease. Xylella fastidiosa is the culprit behind a number of illnesses that affect food-producing plants. Unfortunately, there is no cure for the infection, so when it makes its way into crops like grapes, olives, or citrus, the consequences can be dire. It was 2008 when the first case of one such disease known as Olive Quick Decline Syndrome was discovered in the Italian province of Lecce. By 2015, scientists were estimating 
reporting that 10,000 hectares of Lecce's olive trees had become infected. Basically, half. In other words, the bacteria had spread to one million olive trees, some of which were over a hundred years old, in less than a decade. And this disease has stubbornly resisted attempts at eradication. Luckily, researchers are working on developing ways to protect farmland from Xylella fastidiosa. Like by determining which of the 3,000 species of spittlebug are actually responsible for spreading it. Researchers reported that the meadow spittlebug was the main culprit in spreading the bacteria in Italian olive groves. The scientists discovered that in August 2014, nearly 100 percent of meadow spittlebugs they collected in Italy's Salento Peninsula tested positive for the bacteria. Researchers are also testing other types of prevention and treatment techniques, including chemical sprays that help slow the spread of the disease. It seems unfair to blame the tiny spittlebugs for such a deadly threat. After all, they're just trying to live their best lives, swathed in cocoons made of their foamy excrement. So maybe with a little more research we can tackle the real threat and go back to living peacefully alongside these little guys decorating our plants with cuckoo spit. But we are not plants or spittlebugs, so we don't have to resort to those kinds of measures to feed ourselves. Instead, we get to eat things like Vite Ramen. Ramen's beauty is in its versatility. It can be instant or Michelin star quality, and Vite Ramen sets out to bridge the two by making noodles quick and ingredient-centered. Their cooking instructions are simple and their meals are ready in minutes. But they're not the instant ramen you might be familiar with. Vite Ramen meals contain up to 31 grams of protein, 20 seven vitamins and minerals, up to seven grams of fiber, and 50 percent less sodium than leading brands. They make their noodles in-house with flavors like roasted soy sauce chicken, vegan white miso, and beef pho. So if any of those got you salivating, you can click the link below or visit viteramen.com slash scishow to get a bundle with free gifts and shipping in the contiguous USA. And when you use the code scishow at checkout, you will get 10 percent off. Thanks to Vite Ramen for supporting this scishow video. We value our relationship that we have with sponsors, unlike some of the plants and bugs in this video. So, you've seen how the relationship between plants and bugs can get nasty, but they don't have to be. The best case scenario is that they each get what they need out of the relationship, like when they work together to peacefully acquire food. And in the case that Stefan's about to describe, the relationship between plant and insect can even get a carnivorous plant to go vegetarian. Here is how that happened. Plants get most of their food from sunlight and air, but they also need nutrients like nitrogen to survive. And in parts of the world where the soil doesn't have a lot of nitrogen, some plants have evolved a pretty macabre way to meet their needs. They kill and eat animals. And it turns out that some carnivorous plants in Borneo go to even more extreme lengths to get their fix. They've gone back to playing nice, at least with some creatures, in exchange for a precious, nitrogen-rich resource, animal feces. Nepenthes is a genus of pitcher plants, carnivorous plants plants that make pitcher-shaped traps. But in one species, the fanged pitcher plant, these traps are home to diving ants. Pitcher plants colonized by these ants have bigger leaves and a greater number of leaves, which makes them more efficient at photosynthesis. And in order to grow more leaves, plants need more nitrogen, since it's a key component of many cellular building blocks. In fact, researchers estimate that fanged pitcher plants occupied by diving ants contain 200 percent more nitrogen, so they really seem to benefit from these ants. At first glance, that seems weird, given that diving ants form their colonies inside the long, hollow tendrils that the pitchers hang by, and they feed on the nectar that trickles out of the namesake teeth on the pitcher's rim. So their very presence costs the plant resources. Plus, they straight up steal the plant's prey. The plant's digestive juices aren't that great at breaking things down, and as their name suggests, these ants can dive into this weak digestive soup to fish out partially eaten bugs before the plant has a chance to finish them. But they do actually help the plant in several ways. Like, they hunt other insects that hang out in the traps and munch on what the plant has caught. Also, they hide under the pitcher's rim and ambush insects as they land, and since they're kind of messy eaters, they end up dropping bits that fall into the pitcher, which are way easier for the plant to digest. But most importantly, these ants poop directly into the pitcher juice. And by doing so, they give back some of the nutrients they borrow when they fish bugs out of the trap. And that's actually where most of that extra nitrogen comes from. Now, the fanged pitcher isn't the only Bornean pitcher plant that's 
figured out feces are full of nutrients. Some species partner with much larger poopers. For example, Lowe's pitcher plants. When they're young, they have typical pitcher traps. But as they mature, they start growing weirdly shaped ones instead. These new pitchers have a lid that secretes more nectar than any other Nepenthes species. And this nectar attracts the local mountain tree shrews, big-eyed rodents about 18 centimeters in length. The thing is, the only way the tree shrews can get the nectar is by positioning their rump right inside the pitcher. And it just so happens that this species of shrew marks places where good food can be found with poop. So as they're licking off the nectar, the pitcher plant gets lots of nitrogen and other nutrients. Scientists found that this close relationship between pitcher plants and shrews also occurs in two other species. All get up to 100% of their nitrogen from tree shrew poop, though each uses a slightly different setup to trap the shrew's butt in the right place. And even though more research is necessary, scientists hypothesize that the plants also evolved a mechanism to protect the structure of immature toilet pitchers from shrews until they're sturdy enough to support their butts. The fully mature shrew toilet takes on a dark purple hue that the tree shrew can actually see, so it's thought the color signals that the nectar toilet is open for business. And what's cool about all of this is that though these tree shrews are small by human standards, they're not extremely tiny. So the pitchers of these plant species are big, so big that they make them the biggest carnivorous plants known to science. Still, when it comes to pitcher reshaping, they've got nothing on their cousin, Nepenthes hemsleyana. Its pitchers grow a peculiar lid, shaped sort of like a bat's ear. In fact, researchers discovered that, much like an actual bat's ear, this structure is a perfect reflector of the ultrasound cries that bats use for echolocation. And there's a good reason for that. You see, Hardwick's woolly bats roost in the pitchers. The pitcher wall shields them from the scorching sun during the day and keeps their skin free of parasites, since the noxious critters can't lay their eggs on the pitcher's waxy surface. The pitchers are also shaped in a way that prevents the bats from completely slipping inside, and the plant actually limits the amount of digestive juice in the pitcher so that it doesn't touch the bats behind. So they're quite the cozy place to roost. And Nepenthes hemsleyana, in turn, receives the guano the bats release as they sleep. This mutualistic relationship explains that ear-like lid shape. In the Borneo swamp forest, it might be difficult to find the one species of pitcher plant that really wants you to snuggle in for a day of sleeping and pooping. But because of the highly reflective ear-shaped lids, bats can use their echolocation to navigate to these special pitchers, no matter how much other greenery surrounds them. Whether we're talking about their partnerships with bats, ants, or tree shrews, Nepenthes pitcher plants remind us that there's no one way to have a nutritious diet. And one organism's waste can always be another one's treasure. So the plant and insect can have a beautiful symbiotic relationship, and it doesn't even need to revolve around food, although many relationships do. Sometimes they get together for protection. Here is how a plant attracts an insect as a bodyguard. Plants are a lot like animals, at least in the sense that they have to get nutrients to grow, fight off anything that wants to eat them, and reproduce. But unlike most animals, you may have noticed, plants can't just get up and move around, which is why some of them put out nectar to recruit bodyguards. Lots of flowering plants produce sugary nectar, which attracts pollinators like birds, bats, and insects. They take the pollen with them to the next flower, helping the plant reproduce. But a few plants have evolved a completely separate source of nectar. They're known as extrafloral nectaries, special structures outside the flower that produce a liquid cocktail of sugars and amino acids. A lot like the nectar inside flowers, just in a more strategic place. And as nectar eaters defend their source of food, the plant ends up with bodyguards. Nectars, both the floral and extrafloral kind, are meant to attract and reward animals, creating what's called a mutualistic relationship. The animals benefit from the nectar since they get food, and the plant gets either pollinators or protection. It's a win-win. For instance, in inga plants in tropical rainforests, ants will get rid of other plant-eating insects. These outside nectaries are rich in carbohydrates like sucrose and glucose, as well as proteins and amino acids, all important nutrients for the ants. In exchange for the food, the ants protect the plants from invaders like caterpillars. They're pretty good at it, too. Studies have shown that leaves without ants get much more damage than leaves that do have ants. And when a plant eater comes to munch on its leaves, the inga can make extra nectar as a bonus incentive for the ants. The plant is basically saying, come help, I'm under attack, take more sugar. Then there's the passion flower, a North American plant that has extra floral nectaries at the base of each leaf and under the flower bud. The passion flower already has poisonous chemicals in its leaves, but some species of butterfly evolved an immunity to the toxic leaves, and recruiting 
feeding ants gives the flower another line of defense. In the 1980s, a group of researchers removed the outside sources of nectar from some passion flowers. They found that those plants had fewer ants around them, were attacked more, and made less fruit. Even cotton plants have them, though they aren't looking for ants. They're trying to attract parasitic wasps. These wasps are a lot different from the yellow jackets invading your summer picnic. For one thing, they're tiny. They also happen to lay their eggs inside caterpillars. The eggs hatch into larvae while they're still in the caterpillar and start to eat it, eventually clawing their way out through its skin, all while it's still alive. Then they take over the caterpillar's mind, forcing it to protect them as they keep growing. Once they fly away, the caterpillar starves to death. As you can probably imagine, it's an effective way to kill a caterpillar, which is why some cotton farmers use these wasps as a natural pesticide. The cotton plant sets out its nectar as a food source for the mini wasps, and in return for the sugary snack, the parasitic wasps stick around and take over the caterpillars. But nectar is good for defending against more than just insects. According to a study published in 2009 in the Plant Journal, it also has compounds that protect the plant from invading viruses, bacteria, and fungi. For example, the nectar of certain acacia plants contains proteins called chitinases that stop invading fungi, meaning that sometimes the extra floral nectar itself is a kind of bodyguard. That nectar doesn't come cheap, though, energy-wise. To make it, the plant has to use energy it would otherwise be using for things like growth and reproduction. But for a lot of plants, it's worth setting out a nectar pot for a little extra security. So the insect protects the plant, and the plant feeds the insect. But in other instances, the roles are reversed. In this next case, the plant protects the insect by keeping it warm. Here's how. Being warm-blooded is really convenient. For one thing, you can go outside when it's snowing or hot without having to worry too much about your body processes shutting down. But not all organisms regulate their body temperature because it's a big drain on energy resources. It's mostly just birds, mammals, and some plants. A few hundred species of plants produce their own heat in a process called thermogenesis, and some of them use that heat to regulate their body temperature. It's based on the same idea as warm-bloodedness in animals. Energy can be released as heat. Plenty of your normal, everyday metabolic processes like digestion release heat as a byproduct, but if that's not enough, you can also shiver, causing the chemical processes involved in muscle contractions to release more heat. When an animal can't shiver, like a newborn human baby or a hibernating bear, it can burn brown fat instead, a special kind of fat that's full of glucose and produces lots of heat when it's broken down. But plants can't shiver, and they don't have brown fat. So plants produce heat using another mechanism, a type of cellular respiration known as thermogenic respiration respiration that takes place in their mitochondria. Mitochondria are usually described as the powerhouses of this cell, and for good reason. Their job is to store energy in the form of the molecule ATP. But in thermogenic respiration, the mitochondria skip the ATP and just release the energy as heat. At the most basic level, thermogenesis just keeps these plants warmer than their surroundings. But a handful of species, like the eastern skunk cabbage and the sacred lotus, take it one step further, with feedback mechanisms that they use to keep their body temperatures within a certain range or thermoregulate. And thermoregulatory plants, decreasing internal temperatures triggers more cyanide-resistant respiration, keeping them warm. And if their temperatures get too high, they can just produce less heat and start to cool off. Now, thermogenesis might seem like a huge waste of energy, and it is, but for these plants, the advantages make the energy loss worth it. In some cases, it helps them avoid frost or keep snow away. The skunk cabbage, for example, can melt through snow, giving it early access to pollinating insects, while other plants are still buried. But many thermogenic plants are tropical, so they wouldn't have much reason to develop resistance to frost. And plenty of plants bloom just fine when it's cold out. Other plants are trying to attract pollinators, either by providing the perfect temperatures for mating insects or just by making themselves smellier. Like a dumpster on a hot day, a warmer plant will smell a lot worse. For instance, when a dead horse arum is blooming, it releases more than a hundred volatile compounds in its attempt to lure hungry bugs to the smell of rotting flesh. It only blooms for a couple of days every few years, so it needs to attract as many pollinators as possible, but it also needs to trap them there for a while. In the dead horse arum, the female florets mature on the first day, but the male florets mature on the second day, so the pollinators are most effective if they stick around long enough for both phases. When a fly crawls down into the base of the flower, a series of spines keep them from getting out again. Hopefully, the flies picked up pollen from an earlier blooming flower, so the female florets get pollinated. The next day, the male florets release their pollen, which attaches to the fly. Then the spines wither, so the fly can go free, and it falls for the same trick again, landing on what it thought was a lump of dead flesh, but turns out to be another flower in disguise. Good news for the bugs, though. There might be benefits for them, too. One study looked at the species of beetles that pollinate thermoregulating philodendrons. Normally, these beetles have to produce lots 
of heat themselves so that they can stay active at night. But the researchers found that when the insects were trapped in the flowers overnight, they only needed to use about half as much energy. For an insect, landing on a thermogenic plant is like curling up next to a nice warm radiator, just one that happens to smell like a dead horse. So insects and plants may have a tumultuous relationship at times, but it's often a beautiful one that benefits them both.